Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine. Plus, global business, finance, and tech news. The Bloomberg Business Week podcast with Carol Masser and Tim Stenebeck from Bloomberg Radio. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Bloomberg Business Week weekend podcast. Big, big week. Yes, another Fed decision. But what consumed most was the U.S. presidential election that will send Donald Trump back to the White House. The so-called Trump trade kicked into action post-election day, driving Bitcoin to a record, spiking Treasury yields and sending stocks rallying. One name benefiting Elon Musk's Tesla. More on the relationship between the world's richest man and the president-elect. Plus, ARK Invest Kathy Wood on Elon, the elections, the Fed, and more. We begin, though, with the aftermath of the U.S. presidential election. The vote count ended a lot sooner than most anticipated as it handed a definitive victory for former President Donald Trump and set off some soul-searching for the Democratic Party. Trump's win is a tale of widespread discontent, creating a deficit too deep for Kamala Harris to overcome. So writes Bloomberg Businessweek editor Brad Stone. Brad joined us to help answer the question, what happened? Well, look, um, you know, we always look back on our elections and and sort of contemplate a, a, a pithy summation of what happened. So Trump in 2016 kind of bringing Americans to reject Obama's glo- globalist optimism. You know, you can go back Obama, his message of hope after the Great Recession. And so I was really kind of thinking about, well, what are we going to take from this? And and the most obvious explanation, the big one that stands out is that people were just dissatisfied with the current state of things economically. I mean, you had a president deep underwater in Biden, his popularity, his approval rating at 41 percent, 26 percent of Americans dissatisfied with the direction of the company. That's the easiest and most obvious explanation. But when I talk about the, the kind of muddy uh, factors. I mean, there's just so much we don't know. The fact that uh, Vice President Harris lost ground with Latino voters, uh, non-college educated female voters, young voters. I mean, there's clearly something else going on here. And I think it will take a while for us to really look at the data and understand what went on. One thing that's that's really striking to me, again, the data is still continuing to sort of come out here, Brad, and there's been a lot of hand wringing by a lot of different uh, groups here at this point. But turnout, just wasn't there, even on the Republican side in terms of gross numbers compared to 2020. Do you have any idea what happened there? I mean, it's yeah, it's it's remarkable. I mean, maybe there's a little bit of political exhaustion. I mean, the vice president, uh, you know, talked a little bit about that on the campaign trail. You know, in 2020, the election we're comparing it to, we were in the very midst of the pandemic. You know, maybe there weren't all, all that many alternatives at the time to getting engaged in the electoral process and voting. Um, you know, there might have just been something about uh, the options and the candidates that voters had to turn them off. So, no, I think, you know, um, when, when you look particularly on the Democratic side, the, the depressed voter turnout was a major factor uh, behind the across the board defeats. Brad, you know what's really striking to me? And we actually heard this from Jay Powell over and over again. He talked about how good of an economy it is right now. Spot firing on all cylinders. Inflation's coming back to 2%. The unemployment rate is, is pretty in balance with where he wants it to be. That's not the message that I got in terms of, of this election. That's not the message that voters sent, especially in those swing states. What's the misery index? And explain how you looked at that. Yeah, Bloom- Bloomberg had, I, I thought, a very prescient article about a week ago that talked about how uneven that economic re- recovery was, and that despite the overall positive kind of macro numbers on jobs, on inflation, on gas prices, that you know there are pockets of unhappiness. And we looked at the swing states, where you you know states like Wisconsin or Michigan, or, you know Ohio, states that did vote for President Trump, um, where the misery index, as you say, Tim, that combination of inflation data, unemployment data is still very high. And so there are things like population declines in some counties, um, uh, uh, still a stumbling recovery, high unemployment numbers that were clearly fueling the dissatisfaction that may have turned the election. It's so interesting because it seems like the chattering class kind of thought that presidential candidate who has been accused of so many different things, who has been determined by a court to actually be a felon, 34 different counts, 
and has had so many struggles, at least with the law over the last few years, oversaw not really what he would say, but no question that he was there on, on January 6th and all the comments that he's made about that have been well documented. But that just didn't matter at all in the end to voters. Well, uh, certainly not to a majority of the voters that turned out in, in this election. Um, you know, may, maybe it did propel some to stay home. Um, you know, it may also be that people have short-term memories. I mean, my colleague Mark Millian writes in the Business Week newsletter about nostalgia. Um, nostalgia can be a powerful political force. You know, make America great again. Uh, Reagan's shining city on a hill, evoking these memories. So, you know, nostalgia as a political force, I kind of like the idea, but it also maybe suggests that specific memories aren't as powerful as these vague memories of a greater time and that in, in, in talking about making America great again and all the implicit things in that statement, you know, that Trump is distracting people from the specifics of maybe how they felt about his leadership during the pandemic, how they felt about some of his, you know, crimes, alleged and otherwise, uh, and, and brought their attention more on, you know, restoring this sense, maybe illusory, uh, that he can help, you know, bring America back to some previous greatness. So, so I, you know, I'm, I'm wondering about sort of the lesson, uh, and it's not our job to, to sort of give a lesson to Democrats here, but as I mentioned, there's a lot of hand-wringing going on, and, and we've written about that. It's, it's been well documented. But the Monday morning or the Wednesday morning quarterbacking, the shoulda, woulda, coulda, it, it sort of seems like, in hindsight, some of it actually went back to the current president's decision to continue running until that became untenable. Well, look, I mean, Tim, I'm not a, a political analyst uh, by any means, but, uh, you know, I would say this. I mean, first of all, the, the, the margin of the victory, you know, for Trump was so big that, you know, perhaps any one factor might not have even had made a difference. And Good two, point. you know, the, the Democratic Party, you know, the fact that there is no longer a chance or a hope of changing minds in Ohio, you know, my home state, or Florida it used to be a swing state. The fact that the Democratic Party doesn't speak to, you know, middle class or lower class voters in states like Arkansas or Oklahoma, you know, where, you know, arguably uh, voters there might appreciate some factors of the Democratic agenda, raising the, you know, the, the minimum wage, um, restoring uh, protections for health care and insurance, you know, that, that they that the Democrats rely on, you know, three Midwestern swing states, the so-called blue wall or hope to turn Arizona or Nevada or North Carolina. It just feels like there needs to be an overhaul, you know, a, re a rebalancing uh, of expectations in the Democratic Party if they really hope to compete going forward. Yeah. You know, it's it's fun. You, you mentioned blue wall, but I've heard people say they might need to re rechange the change the name of that, given what's happened in the last three elections, whereas Democrats only won the blue wall states in one of those last three, and that was in 2020. Hey, I wanted to talk about with you some of the other uh, stories that uh, you and the team over at Bloomberg Businessweek have been highlighting in, in recent days. There's been a lot of hand wringing about polling uh, and the idea that every poll that we got, save for a couple polls that people thought were outliers at the time, really showed this race neck and neck, a coin flip. I, I, it's pretty remarkable to see you're the team Chadwick Matlin and Alex Tanzi argue that the red even though there was a red wave we shouldn't be blaming the polls what's going on here I, I may not be so charitable as Alex and Chad on this <laughs> okay. one. Um, you know, there is an argument, and pollsters make it, that, hey, uh, the results were within the margin of error, so they weren't technically wrong. And, and Chad and Alex write that pollsters are often uh, more accurate than they are precise, which to me feels a little bit like, you know, when the when fo your football team loses and they still say they played a great game. You know, it's it like... <laughs> All these states, all the swing states, uh, sure, they might have been within the margin of error. They're still very close. But they all underestimated Trump's support. They were all sort of directionally wrong in the same way. And then you look at states like Florida uh, or Texas, and they really extremely underestimated Trump's support well outside the margin of error. And I, I, I think that, you know, pollsters still haven't quite figured out Donald Trump's support. This time around, they weighted their results. They tried to account for communities like is the respondent in a rural area or how did they vote previously? And I just don't think they have quite figured it out or gotten it right. And I, and I think, you know, if you were if you made the mistake once again of putting your faith in the polls, you are probably very disappointed uh, 
uh, last Tuesday night. Yeah, that's a good point. And in the outlier polls that I was talking about, I mean, there have been these, you know, sort of hopium polls for Democrats out there, like the one we got Saturday night from Ann Seltzer that showed that Pre uh, Vice President Harris was actually leading in Iowa by a margin of four. What did she lose, four, 14 points? Yeah, it was, wasn't even close. So it's, it's pretty remarkable to see that. Do you think, Brad, that um, we have to, as Americans, have to adjust the way that we view polling? Or, or do we have to figure out a better way to poll? Yeah, I, I mean, my, my opinion is it's a, it's a broken science. You know, it, re, it relies on a voluntary response from people that are now connected in all sorts of different ways. We're, we're all besieged by text messages and spam and other kinds of unsolicited email. And so most people's instinct is to kind of reject an unsolicited query. And, you know, and then you layer on top of that, that we live in such a polarized environment that some people don't want to express their opinion because they might be, you know, they might, they might feel uh, judged by their community. And so I think, you know, the polling community needs to kind of come together and figure out if there is a path forward. And then, yeah, as voters, as in the, in the media, as the electorate, I think that relying on polling right now is, is very dangerous. Help us figure out the path forward a little bit, the best you can. Not asking you to make predictions, but you are one of the few people who has sat down with President-elect Trump in recent months. You did that down at Mar-a-Lago for a Bloomberg Businessweek cover story that really covered pretty much every gamut of the economic agenda of the president-elect. Give us an idea of how you view, if any, his agenda has shifted since then. It was before his assassination attempt. It was before the convention. It was before his selection of J.D. Vance. And it was, of course, before he won the election versus what you've heard from him now and how he puts that into action in the coming months during the transition and what that looks like January 20th. I mean, Tim, I, I just have no idea. Um, <laughs> uh, he's feeling extraordinarily empowered. Um, he's feeling totally vindicated. Um, he, uh, there will be no checks on the appointees to his cabinet, to, to judicial postings. You know, at the same time, like my impression of him when we did go down there in July uh, and just watching him over these past 10 years is that, you know, he does see himself as a man of the people. He wants to be liked. It's extraordinarily important to him to be liked and respected and admired. And I don't think that impulse goes away now that arguably he's not going to ever face election again. So when it comes to some of the things that he's proposed, um, you know, mass deportations or tariffs that could, you know, according to economists, raise the rate of inflation. You know, he's not going to have any practical moderating influences, but, you know, he doesn't want to, I, I don't think it's in his nature to want to do broadly unpopular things. So I do wonder if that will end up being a check on, on some of his instincts. Uh, although, you know, the one thing that we heard from him on Tuesday night was he said, you know, promises offered, promises will be fulfilled. So I do expect him, you know, to come in, into office looking to immediately put points to the board and to fulfill some of the promises that he made on the, on the campaign trail. Look, I'm not going to ask you to give up what you're talking to your reporters about in your editorial meetings, but you have a job that requires you to think pretty clearly about what things will look like in the next few months because you're responsible for uh, assigning stories and uh, understanding what people are going to be talking about in the future. How are you thinking about covering uh, the president-elect? We are going to be looking very precisely at the, the challenges and battles ahead for the new administration. And, and we have reached out into the Bloomberg newsroom around the world to, to look at, you know, what is ahead in, in, in Europe, in China, uh, in Im, 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 immigration, cryptocurrencies on, on Wall Street and in tech. Um, you know, we did. We were thinking of it in terms of the battles ahead. And it'll be interesting now because I'm not so sure there will be battles, um, you know, uh, uh, Trump isn't going to have a lot of political opposition if he does control all three branches of Congress. But, you know, certainly we saw today Gavin Newsom calling a special legislative session in California. A lot of the states girding to try to put checks on, on what the administration will do, either legislatively or in the courts. And so that's that's our approach, you know, to cover it carefully and to try to look forward rather than back and, and, and look at, you know, what the Trump agenda will look like and what it will mean for business. Well, we look forward to following following the story closely and following it at Bloomberg Business Week. Brad, really appreciate you taking the time to join us this afternoon. Brad Stone is Bloomberg Business Week editor. He's also the author of four books, including the New York Times bestseller, Amazon Unbound, Jeff Bezos, and the Invention 
of a global empire. If you do want to subscribe to Bloomberg Business Week and unlock deep reporting and analysis from our reporters around the world, including unlimited access to the magazine, check out our offers right now at Bloomberg.com slash subscribe now. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern. Listen on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. The results of Tuesday's election may have come as a surprise to a lot of people, but not to Ed Price. When he was with us back in October, he shared with us what he learned on his summer road trip driving across the country, 8,500 miles from New York to San Francisco through Yellowstone, and then back to New York through New Orleans. Complaints about prices in the economy came from many people he spoke to, and there was not a Harris sign to be seen in the Rust Belt. So he called it for Trump a few months ago. Now he writes, things may get seriously weird. Ed Price is a former British trade official, now non-resident senior fellow at NYU. He's advised members of the European and British parliaments. The people have spoken. The people have spoken loudly. I'm just not sure if they've also spoken clearly. And by that, I mean, yes, obviously, this is a massive endorsement of the Trump we know. Is it also a massive endorsement of the Trump to come? To what extent is this a cultural shift, a moment that is a pivot, right, in, in the zeitgeist? Or is it, was it just about the economy? Was it really just that Kamala didn't quite bite with the, with the voters? I'm not sure. What do you mean when you write, the people who identified Trump as a threat to democracy must now recognize him as the product of democracy or they risk belittling the system. Right, so I'm one of those people, right? I'm one of the people in public mm -hmm. who not only called this, but I've been going around to anyone that will listen saying this guy is dangerous. Like, let's go and read some history, like he's clearly dangerous. And never mind me, right? There are very prominent, famous Americans who have been doing the same thing, like Liz Cheney. Um, what I mean by that is that now we have to shut up. Now we have to get behind this result. Because if we now turn around as a cohort of predominantly uh, disgruntled Republicans and Democrats and say, hey, you know what, um, this is illegitimate, or we go anywhere near suggesting that somehow it's not right, we are doing more or less exactly what Trump did on January 6th, maybe not physically, but this is, this is the real problem, I think. Ed, is this democracy at work or democracy broken? Well, I would say Europe is seeing a similar move toward what some would refer to as strong men or at least populism mm -hmm. that we've seen here in the U.S. over the last eight years. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so fair. So, fair. But so I, I don't know. Yeah. I'm just trying to understand if this is part of the democratic process. So here's, here's the deep, dark secret, guys, okay? Just, you know, huddle around, right? <laughs> We're not supposed to be a democracy. We're supposed to be a republic, which is different. The original design was very mindful of populism. They wouldn't have called it that. Yeah. But you know, the founders designed a constitution effectively to check a king, to keep a king in a box, because you needed some executive. We all know this, right? The Federalists, Jefferson, and all the rest of it. Um, as we've trended through our rightful progressive history, and we've sort of built this promise of 1776 into something real, we've also extended the franchise, extended this sense that, you know, of human dignity to the point that we are now a mass democracy. That is not what the founders wanted, exactly because sometimes people can choose uh, candidates that might be suboptimal in their belief regarding democracy. So this, this is why we're stuck, right? This is the paradox. I'm obsessed with this essay that was in the New York Times and I sent around to the team and it says what, what we just went through wasn't an election, it was a hostage um, situation. Oh our, our major parties, <laughs> it's written by Tyler Austin Harper, assistant professor okay. of environmental studies at Bates. But yeah. he says, our major parties represents the interests of streaming magnets, the arms industry, oil barons, Bitcoin ghouls, and big tobacco, often without even pretending to heed the needs of voters. A political system like that is fundamentally broken. We consistently talk about money and the amount of money in politics. We talked mm -hmm. about how much money was spent, right. how much money was maybe spent by a one billionaire. Yes. Do you agree? No, I don't agree with that. For me, that, that sounds sort of Marxist around the edges, right? Just to say, right, America's a write-off, we're done. It, this is the line I'm trying to walk, okay? I'll be honest with you, I'm horrified. I woke up this morning, I felt like I was hungover or sick. That's probably a reaction a lot of people have, have had. I don't get it, right? But he is elected. We cannot now say the whole system is broken simply because there was a, a mass poll. I mean, the guy's going to win the popular vote. What we have to do is have better civics. I don't for the life of me know why we extend the First Amendment to Russian troll firms, for example. Mm. I mean, this is nuts, mm -hmm. okay? So it's, it's third parties as well, right, o outside. Right. And here's, here's something that sort of scared me. 
apparently the Russians were putting in bomb threats in parts of the country where it could have swung, swung around, right? I mean, that's hey, crazy. I, 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 Ed, you, yeah. you, you said something really interesting because I think you, you're feeling something that certainly I, I would imagine other Americans are feeling, but at the same time, you had tens of millions of people, and again, the former president, president-elect, will win the popular vote this time around. Mm -hmm. First time in two decades, mm -hmm. Republicans have done that. It's pretty remarkable. Um, they were obviously uh, saw his economic message as incredibly appealing. Mm -hmm. But now the rubber meets the road. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine, I can't see the future, but he, he has to deliver on mm -hmm. that promise. Mm -hmm. Can he, he do to. that? I, look, I mean, the U.S. economy is a powerful beast. It's outperformed my home country, for example. Mm -hmm. It makes money. It makes people richer, right? I don't think that's within the gift of economic policymakers or, or presidents per se. Um, will he deliver on that? Again, I'd be lying to you guys. How many times have we chatted and I've said, I don't know. Like, yeah. Okay. I think he probably can if he, if he puts certain you know, bits and bobs in place. Um, but on that, I mean, let's just say one more thing about this for me. The Democrats have messed up wildly. Uh, this is not good. And one of the thoughts I had this morning when I was looking in the mirror was, maybe I'm the deplorable, right? Maybe I'm the global elitist, elitist deplorable, because I've sort of been looking at my neighbors thinking, oh, God, you know, why, why would you vote for this guy? So if he does deliver, back to the core point, right? Uh, they were right, and I was wrong. So your net net takeaway bottom line is the democratic process has happened yes get behind your president uh, up and until anything illegal happens now this is also something that could that could go down and i worry that in a gray area if the new president does things that kind of tinker around the edges of the constitution it's not an outright attack there will be many people in the system who don't quite know, like, which republic am I, you know, loyal to here? The office that is telling me to do something that I think is a bit sketchy um, or not, right? And so this could be a problem, right? I mean... Do we still have checks and balances? For now. I don't know that the Supreme Court is balanced uh, by design. Um, if he has a full sweep, right? Uh, I, I can't believe I'm about to say this on air, honestly. The ultimate check and balance we have is the U.S. Army. Okay, the military, I have full faith and confidence that the oath that they take to the Constitution is our ultimate backstop. But look, I don't want to be alarmist. I, I said what I've said. He's won. Somebody somewhere in the Democratic Party is going to have to either resign or apologize uh, because this is not, not good for the Democratic Party at all. Or he could be someone who gets into the office and realizes the kind of weight of that job and the mm -hmm. importance of the U.S. economy mm -hmm. in the global economy mm -hmm. and do good things for or, the U.S. I mean, uh, yeah, like we don't know, right? Or the market oh, checks him. Yeah. Or the market, like I keep thinking yeah. the market, yeah, yeah, yeah. the that's financial a, that's markets a, that's a are going to check that's a, that's it. A, that's a good point. Capital markets do what they want to do. Yeah. Uh, and at some point, um, the way we're playing with debt, markets will warn us uh, and, they, and he may be in office when they do that. So, yeah. So interesting. Um, lots to think about. Ed lots Price. to think about. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our thanks to Ed Price, former British trade official, non-resident senior fellow over at NYU, principal for geopolitical forecasting at the global intelligence and consulting firm Ergo, joining us right here in our studio. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Listen live each weekday starting at 2 p.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. We continue our post-election coverage with a look at one of Donald Trump's biggest supporters this election cycle. Yes, we are talking about Elon Musk. The Tesla CEO and world's wealthiest person, according to the Bloomberg Billionaires Index, spent more than $130 million on pro-Trump efforts. He hosted town halls in the critical state of Pennsylvania. He promised a $1 million giveaway for swing state voters and appeared at Trump's Madison Square Garden rally with an even higher billing than the Republicans' own running mate, J.D. Vance. Trump's win sent Tesla shares surging as much as 15 percent the day after the election, marking its highest level this year. For more on the role of Elon in a second Trump term, we leaned on Bloomberg Businessweek columnist and contributor to the Elon Inc. podcast, Max Chafkin. When all is said and done and we have all the filings, I would not be surprised if Elon Musk's contribution was closer to 200, if not even higher than that. But 
whatever it was, it's way less than the potential, you know, it's a paper gain of, say, $15 billion. And really, that's the tip of the iceberg, because Tesla, although it is a highly regulated business, it does benefit from lots of government policy that could be impacted by by a new presidency. It isn't the most direct impact. The most direct one is SpaceX, which is Elon Musk's giant uh, defense contractor and rocket, uh, you know, company. And, you know, SpaceX already has, you know, huge contracts from the federal government. Trump on the campaign trail talked a lot about the potential for more contracts, you know, talking about a Mars mission, which uh, would would likely feature uh, SpaceX prominently and be worth, you know, billions, if not tens of billions of dollars. There's also potential government money for Starlink, Elon Musk's satellite internet company. You know, Elon Musk has other businesses that, that could also benefit from this, the Boring Company, which is, you know, an infrastructure play. You know, Neuralink, that's federal regulated. This is a guy who does business with government regulators in one way or another all the time. And so he arguably, I think from the point of view of the Trump campaign or Trump supporters, he understands it, but but obviously he has a lot to, to gain. How does this work though? Like I think about the training we all do as employees about conflicts of interest and you can't have them. So, you know, where are regulators on having a CEO of a publicly held company that has US government contracts, has global government contracts, having possibly a job in the US government, secretary of cost cutting perhaps? How does that work? How can it work? I mean, does he have to sell off his Tesla holdings to do this? Well, so, so first of all, I think you should think about Elon Musk's influence in the White House to be at least partly informal rather than formal, because formal influence, like, I don't think we're talking about a Senate confirmed position. I think that would be very hard. I think he does very much does not want to give up control of any of his companies or even have to sell stock or even have to put stock in a trust. He, he wants to continue running his companies and also contribute to the White House. That's kind of how he has framed it. So, you know, my guess is some sort of ex, you know, like not not in the government, but but having some sort of advisory role. You know, Trump did this a little bit in 2016. And I should also say, one thing we learned during that time is that, you know, there are formal roles in the White House, yeah. and then there is probably the most important, important job, which is like, who is speaking to Donald Trump regularly? And that, I think we, we know Elon Musk is doing that regularly. He's clearly top of mind during that 25 minute or so victory speech. Elon Musk praise took up like, I don't know, between five and seven minutes. It, it was a substantial part of how Trump framed his candidacy and how he's thinking right now. What have you learned just in the last, I don't know, six weeks about what Elon Musk's priorities are, given what he's posted on X, what he's talked about at rallies and the influence that he would have on a second Trump administration? Well, I think the priorities are the business priorities, probably first and foremost. You know, but he's talked about immigration. A lot right. Too. Yes, and but I but I would say that Elon Musk has emerged. I think there were people as Elon Musk started to sort of dip his toe into politics, thinking that he would be a normal. This would be like a normal business guy engaging politically, which is you write a check and you turn around and you, you you're out of it, right? And I think Elon Musk has the intention of being a political player going forward. That is, you know, I was getting questions from from friends and, and so on saying, well, what's stopping Trump from just turning around, taking Elon's money and not doing any of the stuff he wants, not giving SpaceX another contract? And the answer is, besides the fact that Elon Musk is a popular guy, that you could make the argument that Elon Musk's support was meaningful, you know, perhaps even push it, helping to push Donald Trump over the edge. But even if you leave that aside, Elon Musk ha is saying that he is going to be a major political donor in the midterm. Mm -hmm. So so he has potentially millions, tens of millions, maybe even hundreds of millions of dollars more money that he is planning on spending. He is going to be, as he said, you know, the, the George Soros of the right, the power broker, the the business guy who, who can make or break your campaign. So transactional or he likes politics all of a sudden? I think he is, I think he's obviously interested in, in what, in how he could benefit. Okay. Um, and, and that is very, and so in that sense, yes, transactional. But I think, I think you really need to look at this as a play for influence and for power that goes beyond just like any, any one contract or anything like that. There's no shortage of, of folks, and they've been all over cable news over the last two years, uh, former Trump administration officials who felt burned by the former president and president-elect who are now opposed to him within his or people very the vice president right, for right. example uh what are the chances that that musk's relationship goes sour 
with well, Trump over the next couple of years. I mean, I think just if you look at the personalities, these are these are two men who really like to occupy the kind of main role, the central role. It's hard to imagine them being able to hang out in a room together and and defer to one another. That said, uh, I think the the reasons that brought them together will keep them together at least for some time. And you got to look at you know we talked about the money, the con- the political contributions to President. To President elect Trump, but we should be talking also about X, these kind of in kind contributions. Mm -hmm. Elon Musk bought Twitter and now X, and he he invested a lot of money. He's lost a lot of money on this thing, but he has really navigated it to a position of influence. He is arguably, in addition to being the richest guy, the most important conservative media mogul. And and he's gonna so so he's gonna have a lot of influence over Trump uh, over the next four years. Do you think more important than Rupert Murdoch? Uh, yes, I think it's more important than and Rupert more, Murdoch. More import- important than uh, Trump's own social media uh, company? I mean, I think we have to... Uh, how do, but how, do, but how, do, how does Trump say, wait, I want to put it on Trump social or Truth whatever? Social. Truth social. sorry. We, you know, Elon right. Musk was ar- already arguably the most powerful person yeah. in the world. And I think undoubtedly now you have to say yeah. he's a candidate. Max Chafkin, thank you. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern. Listen on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. We are very pleased to have Kathy Wood for her first interview since the election of Donald Trump earlier this week. Kathy, shares of your flagship fund, the ARK Innovation ETF, surged more than 8% on Wednesday. It was the best day in more than a year. Part of the risk on trade that we saw on optimism of a second term for Donald Trump in the White House. And that's where I want to start with you. Because when you were back on with us uh, in October, you indicated, without actually saying the former president's name, that you preferred a President Trump over President Harris, strictly from the standpoint of the candidate who you saw would ease the regulatory environment. So here we are. What does another Trump administration mean for you and the companies that ARK invests in? Yes, um, regulation, critical. Uh, I think uh, the the regulations that have been creeping into the system, uh, actually, they started to creep in. They've just flooded the system uh, and and really gummed it up. So the first the, the biggest regula- regulatory issues have been around the SEC, especially when it comes to uh, digital assets or crypto legislation, uh, and the FTC as it relates to M&A activity. Uh, I think uh, both there are going to be big changes there, uh, and that is is going to be the beginning, uh, I think, of a lot of regulatory changes. Um, uh, In his first administration, President Trump uh, basically said, for every regulation you want to introduce Mm -hmm. anyone in my administration, you must get rid of two. I think it's going to be... um, maybe more dramatic than that this wow. time around. And I, I also think having Elon Musk, who announced that he'd like to name a new department, the Department of Government Efficiency, uh, get that, D-O-G-E, <laughs> Doge. Doge. <laughs> he, uh, I think he's going to come to, into the administration. I don't think he'll be a formal part of the administration. He'll be uh, more in an oversight role, The more the, as, okay. as I understand. Yeah. Um, well, hey, Kathy, I, I want to jump in here because you mentioned a few things that yeah. I want to follow up on. One is is Elon sure. Musk. Have you talked to Elon since the election? No, I have not talked to him since the election. I, I did see uh, uh, on X that he was part of the family uh, as they were taking the picture around uh, President Trump's uh, acceptance speech. So, you know, I know he's obviously had a, a tremendous impact on the election. I think he had a, a X made a big difference and uh, and his ideas around government efficiency, which will revolve importantly around technology, artificial intelligence is um, is doing wonders for the most bureaucratic organizations out there. We know from Palantir that uh, it is having a tremendous impact on insurance companies, um, underwriting process timelines uh, uh, dropping from two weeks to three hours, 
And uh, even in the military, uh, MAVEN, Palantir's uh, working on MAVEN uh, with the DOD uh, for, for targeting the enemy, they, they have sh uh, shrunk that department. They have, don't need as many people. They've gone from 2,000 to 20 people, right. which it's pretty amazing well, what's going on. And I think we'll see a lot of attrition. Any, any uh, employee leaving the government probably will not be replaced. Okay, I so don't think he'll... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I just took, picked up it. I don't think he'll do two trillion dollars uh, in government spending savings in one year. That might be a five to ten year. And I, I, I think between technology and attrition, uh, and lower regulations, maybe the abolition of certain departments, that uh, that they'll go a long way. So you don't see him serving a, a formal role, but still overseeing some sort of Department of Government Efficiency in an informal way? Help, help me understand what you see him doing yes, and whether yes, or not that could be some sort of threat to, you know, he's a very busy man. Yes, um, I th he's an unbelievable, um, he's the inventor of our age. I think I, I said that uh, in 2015 for the first time when I was on uh, your show with Carol, Carol Masser at the time. Uh, he is the inventor of our age and uh, he is it, he comes into a problem, assesses it with first principles thinking, doesn't care how things have been done and uh, comes back with, you know, ingenious solutions to, to big problems, um, uh, whether it's autonomous mobility in the autonomous taxi space or uh, in in the um, healthcare space, Neuralink, he's he, in the social network space X uh, in AI, XAI, um, but, uh, and a lot of people say, and SpaceX, of course, the entire <laughs> exploration going to Mars. I think a lot of people are, uh, uh, can't believe he can do this, but again, he cuts to the quick, uh, and first principles thinking and surrounds himself with brilliant people, people who really want to solve the hardest problems in the world. And that's part of the secret to his success, very high standards and people who want to be held accountable to very high standards and want to really transform the world. I want to go back to something that you mentioned at the top of our interview, Kathy, and that's the idea of some of the regulatory challenges that you said have cropped up over the last couple of years and during the Biden administration, specifically with regard to the FTC and the SEC not being present in a second Trump administration. How do you think the Trump regime will approach financial regulation, given that he's vowed to replace SEC chair Gary Gensler? What does that look like? I think uh, first, as, as it relates to crypto or digital asset regulation, they're going to replace Gary Gensler with someone who is much more open-minded, I would say, and, and will let the legislative process uh, work, uh, go to work. And, uh, you know, the SEC is supposed to regulate and force laws. They're not supposed to uh, create laws by enforcement, which is what uh, Gary Gensler was doing. So I think uh, that's going to be um, important. I also think if you look at the public equity markets, I think the number of public uh, companies out there right now has been cut in half in, in the last 15, 20 years. The regulatory nightmare of being a public company has kept leaders of companies basically saying, if I don't have to go public, I am not going public. And so I think we're going to see uh, a lot more work in that regard to give, you know, the average investor uh, a, a shot at some of these moonshots. Uh, so I think that's mm. going to become very important. As far as the FTC, you know, the the antitrust has has gone way too far. In, you know, they they were denying mergers and acquisitions that. Really, the, the 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 companies were tangential to one another. They weren't even really in the same market. Uh, so uh, we're seeing, and and yet at the time, at the same time, we've seen these uh, megatech companies grow into you know massive organizations and dominating their market. So they were denying mergers and acquisitions for, you know, think about JetBlue and Spirit Air Airlines. Yeah. That was ridiculous. Well, that was in the same industry, but one is going bankrupt now because because they wouldn't allow 
that M and A. They were just um, dogmatic about it, in in uh, you know, and didn't show to to us at least a, any common sense. You, you also mentioned last time you were on with us, you weren't wild about the idea of tariffs. Uh, and, the, mm -hmm. the, you know, since then, President Trump said that tariff is the most beautiful word in the dictionary. Um, do you think he <laughs> will follow through with his threat of broad tariffs? And how are you preparing and changing your investment style given the threat of tariffs? Yeah, I'd love to talk about that because we've gotten more information. I think uh, the way the president is looking uh, at this is if he puts in place tariffs, the other side of that will be income tax and corporate tax cuts. And uh, and if you think about it, this is how America started. You know, uh, President George Washington, we had no income tax back then. All the taxes were in the form of tariffs. I do think that they're, they're not going to be... Um, you know, crazy tariffs. I, I, they're going to be much more thoughtful and really f focused away from our tr free trade agreement partners and towards those countries that have not been really uh, l letting our companies play on a level playing field within their countries. So I think there's going to be a lot of negotiation around that really, really helping us. But I do think tax cuts, uh, are go ta personal and corporate tax cuts, uh, are going to be much more important than tariffs okay. uh, in terms uh, in terms of the, the growth engine that this economy needs. Uh, I'll, I'll comment on just a couple of other things. I know he wants a weak dollar, but if he puts in place the deregulation and the tax cuts that we expect, uh, the dollar's probably going up. And uh, this reminds me very much of the early Reagan years. It's fascinating what's going on, uh, except the first couple of years of the Reagan administration, he had to deal with back-to-back -back recessions because Volcker was raising interest rates to 15% plus. We've done that. Uh, Trump does not have to face that. We think that the Fed went too far. And I think it's important, too, because uh, what we expect now is there will be a lot of delayed activity as as consumers and businesses try and figure out, OK, mm. how low are taxes going and how is the world going to change? Am I going to get a better deal? So we're going to need lower interest rates. However, if we get the growth beyond that, that tax cuts and these other measures are going to cause, the dollar will probably go up. Uh, so I think that that will be a surprise, but it's an anti-inflationary force as well. Uh, and we're seeing commodities react to uh, the dollar going up now in anticipation of these uh, of these interesting policies. And then I'd love to just say one other thing. A lot of people talk about the deficit, and it is a big deficit in the middle of uh, it's a rolling recession, uh, but th this deficit is worse than the worst deficit that Reagan faced right. at 5.5 percent of GDP. How did he get out of that and Clinton following beyond him? Th more through growth, not through tax increases. Uh, and you can add on top of that government spending restraint. So, you know, this is this is going to be extremely healthy and very important, I think, for the stock market. Um, the stock well, market has gone through a period here of great concentration towards a few stocks. And now we think, and we've seen it in the last few days, there's going to be a broadening out. And we're very excited about that. We'll, we'll talk about that in just a minute. If you're just now joining us, we're joined by Kathy Wood. She's the founder, CEO, and CIO of ARK Invest. She joins us from St. Petersburg, Florida. Kathy, I, I want to talk one more uh, question on regulation, and then uh, we'll get to a little more on Tesla and Elon and you know some of the big themes that, that you're seeing. Um, I'm, I'm wondering about from you what you think specifically in terms of financial assets is being held back by regulators. Like what financial assets do you think should be opened up to the trading masses that haven't been? Well, it's interesting. We um, we launched a venture fund yeah. and we put it in we put it in an interval fund structure, uh, which is regulated by the SEC and 
We've had access to OpenAI, Anthropic, Databricks, SpaceX, Epic, Discord, lots of companies that young people who don't meet the income or net worth thresholds that uh, venture funds require, they can get into our venture fund because it's in the interval fund structure. I think uh, I think we're going to see a much more uh, of a loosening up. You know why we can uh, offer uh, our fund to uh, retail investors for as little as five hundred dollars? It's because we're not taking a carry. We're not charging carried interest, twenty percent of profits. Uh, we do charge a, a, a higher fee than you'd get with public companies. Uh, and I think we're going to see the democratization uh, increasingly of private companies as well. I think this administration uh, will advocate for that and um, and will uh, and will lower regulations, whether it's Sarbane, Oxley, uh, but regulations that uh, have, you know, tied companies in knots. It's very expensive to be a public company now. Uh, and so for any company, as the digital world and the physical world uh, converge, right. and we think that's a big theme going ahead, uh, we're going to need the, the kind of capital raising that the public markets uh, uh, can offer over a long period of time. So okay. I think more and more of that's going to happen. So speaking yes. of the digital and physical worlds converging, we got to talk crypto because Bitcoin at a new record, close to $77,000 per Bitcoin. Update your prediction for us of where you think Bitcoin will go and when now that Trump will serve another term. Yes, uh, he's going to be very uh, Bitcoin friendly for sure, including building a strategic uh, reserve of Bitcoin. Senator Lummis has been at the forefront of advocating for that. So very exciting there. Um, our our price target hasn't changed, except perhaps we're leaning more towards our bull case. Our base case is a million dollars by 2030. And uh, if you go into big ideas, ARC's big ideas from 2023 in the Bitcoin session, section, you'll see how we get to that million dollar, the building blocks of it. You know, it's a substitute for gold. So it's digital gold. Um, it is uh, going to be used uh, as a new asset class. It is a new asset class for institutional investors. A very big idea, starting with uh, with the spot Bitcoin ETFs launched earlier this year. And of course, uh, we're very gratified that ARKB was one of them. Um, and it's going to be used as an insurance policy, uh, both in emerging markets and in developed markets against confiscation of wealth, whether that means outright confiscation of wealth by corruption and so forth, perhaps in emerging markets or by inflation uh, inflation is a highly regressive tax. Now, we don't think inflation is going to be a problem with this administration. In fact, we think that the floodgates of innovation are going to open up and that we're moving into uh, a world tending towards deflation, but good deflation. Hmm. Technologically enabled in, uh, innovation is deflationary. Well so I think many people are going to be really surprised at how low inflation goes in the years ahead. Kathy, I want to talk performance and get an understanding for where you see uh, the future, uh, because yes. you've seen outflows every month in the ARK Innovation ETF this year, except for, for this month. It's a year where you're underperforming the S&P 500 by a wide margin. The ARK Innovation ETF, it's about flat. The S&P 500 up more than 25 percent. What's your message to investors? who've lost money with you? And do you worry that performance will lead to an extended period where you won't attract money? Well, I think, as I've just described, innovation had quite a few obstacles uh, during the last few years. Uh, uh, so that speaks for itself. Um, if you look at our performance, uh, let's break it down. You look at our ARKW, which is our next generation internet fund, very focused on AI and digital assets. It's up more than the market. 
uh, this year, more than I think it's 27, 28 percent. Uh, if you look at ARKG, which is our genomic revolution portfolio, it is down 22 percent. And a big problem for that portfolio has been the lack of M&A, you know, the absence of M&A. This, this group, if any, needs those liquidity events because big companies, big pharma companies need the innovation that is coming out of the smaller company uh, companies. So um, we think that's going to change. We also, if you listen to, uh, uh, now I, I don't know, I don't think he'll be FDA commissioner, but uh, Robert Kennedy, you know, he wants to clean up corruption in healthcare. You know, there are, there are huge lobby, lobbying organizations. Yeah. Uh, for for pharma, they are not they are not uh, out there advocating for the 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 innovators. That's I think a, the most yeah. important thing he said uh, is is this: we want to go back to a, the rich tradition of uh, the gold standard of evidence evidence based science in terms of healthcare, and the tools are here for preventative, predictive. Per, uh, personalized and participatory behavior, uh, uh, um, healthcare. So I think healthcare, that the convergence of healthcare uh, sequencing technologies, DNA, RNA, proteins, sequencing technologies, artificial intelligence, uh, and CRISPR gene well, but, editing. So I want to jump in here because, and I'm glad you brought in. I'm, I'm glad you brought up RFK because I had a question about that to you, Kathy. And I'm afraid it's probably our last one just because we're running out of time. He, he's been a vaccine skeptic. You mentioned RNA technology, mRNA technology, uh, what the COVID vaccines, the newish COVID vaccines were based on. Are you concerned that how he views public health is going to affect innovation happening in the space? No, I'm not. If you read uh, what he said very recently, uh, he sounds pretty libertarian about uh, vaccinations. You know, uh, there are some people who uh, really feel it's important and others who don't and, uh, you know, live and let live. But one, one thing I'd like to say Please. is the, 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 this past administration has been a menace to, to what we're calling the multiomics revolution, which is going to be the most profound application of artificial intelligence and new technologies in history. Going to cure disease. And yet, as I look at the traditional analyst response to uh, these drugs like CRISPR therapeutics and Intellia that are starting to cure disease and how they, they think that's bad business because they don't have an annuity keeping someone keeping someone's symptoms under control. That's an annuity. Mm. Uh, they prefer that to a cure. Uh, in our latest uh, Monday newsletter, it's called uh, 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 Disrupt, Arc Disrupt. Uh, you can find it on Twitter. You'll see that we believe that curing disease is going is going to make the patents of the companies with those cures two to twenty times more wow. valuable than those other kinds. So I think there's a complete misunderstanding of the dawn of the new health age. And I am so excited, so excited that the Trump administration is going to bring this new world to life for us. Kathy Wood, we always want more time with you. Thank you so much for spending a big part of your afternoon with us. We do appreciate it. That's Kathy Wood, the founder, CEO, and CIO over at ARK Invest, joining us from St. Petersburg, Florida. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Listen live each weekday starting at 2 p.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Plenty ahead in our second hour of the weekend edition of Bloomberg Business Week, including the return of the New York Comedy Festival. Caroline Hirsch, founder of Caroline's on Broadway, joins us on this year's lineup of iconic comics and entertainers, including Bill Maher, Jerry Seinfeld, Bruce Springsteen, and more. Plus, Sean White wants to make competitive snowboarding as globally powerful as Formula One. It's all in the Pursuit Ski Special. 
First up this hour, something we like to feature each and every year on Bloomberg Business Week. L'Oreal Paris's Women of Worth for the 19th year is recognizing nonprofit leaders from around the U.S. for their philanthropic achievements. This year, the beauty brand identified 10 changemakers from thousands of entrants who will receive a host of prizes, including $25,000, a mentorship from L'Oreal Paris on how to enhance their business efforts, and access to the brand's national platform to amplify their messages. For more on the 2024 honorees, I was joined by Bloomberg's Katie Greifeld. We caught up with Ali Goldstein, president of L'Oreal Paris USA, and Jonavi Rao, one of the 10 honorees this year. Jonavi is president and founder of New Voters. It's a youth-led national nonprofit. It engages high school students and helps them find their voice in politics. Ali kicked it off for us. L'Oreal Paris Women of Worth, as you said, it's our 19th year of fulfilling this program. It's our great honor, um, and it's really our essential philanthropic program that aligns to our tagline, because you're worth it. Um, as a brand, L'Oreal Paris strives to really, truly support women's empowerment and the idea that everyone is worth it. And what that means is giving back to those and supporting those who are striving you know, to help others. Women helping other women is integrally part of our brand equity. And Women of Worth is a program that does just that. So we recognize 10 honorees every year. Um, we have a, a, an extensive application program, and we find 10 women doing great things with their 10 organizations that span a spectrum of causes. Um, and we support them and highlight what they're doing and really recognize the efforts. For the most part, they're very grassroots. So we find programs that really need us and need our help. So things that are not fully developed and scaled yet. Um, and we bring support, a bit of financial support. We bring awareness. We bring networking and mentorship. And we help them get the, the, a bit of the scale and support that they need to, to do all the great work that they're doing. And of course, uh, one of those women is joining us right now. Janavi, tell us a little bit about New Voters. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for, for having me. We're a youth-led 501c3 dedicated to helping high school students find their voice in politics before they're old enough to vote and then when they become old enough to vote. So 4 million students graduate from high school every single year and around 90% of them are eligible to register and vote by the time they graduate. So this is a basically completely under-targeted population by voter outreach campaigns, by actual campaigns uh, and when it comes to largely voter registration and uh, and because of that massive number if high school students alone if 18 year olds alone voted the same rate as mm. baby boomers 18 year olds would be the deciding voice on every contested election wow. in wow. the country why well why don't they I mean, I think that a big part of it is that lack of outreach. There was a survey by uh, Circle at Tufts, uh, which is one of the leading youth research institutions in the country, and they found that in 2022, less than 50% of 18 to 24 year olds were reached out to by any campaign. And when you think about 18 year olds, if you think about just high school students alone, like I know I'm inundated with those messages being like, Jonavi, we're disappointed in you. Uh, donate to me. <laughs> but I know that the high school students I work with aren't receiving those messages. They're not on these lists because a lot of them aren't going to be 18 because you can register to vote in most states at 17 if you'll be 18 by the election. So they're not getting that outreach. Maybe they don't know they can register to vote in time. And also there is, as I'm sure you guys know, just such a microscope on schools right now mm -hmm. and fear of being political at all that they see civic engagement and voter registration as being part of that. And you can't really blame them because they are being targeted and, and being harassed for doing things. So because of that, schools are really tentative to make voter registration, even though schools are meant to prepare students for future life and being an active civic and democratic participant is essential to that, they are not integrating voter registration into the programming. But logistical issues aside of you know people getting reached out to, I also think that there is a lack of civics education in this country and a lack of seeing that democracy and voting is a way to create change. I think that any discussion, and I, I I, if you guys have young people in your lives, I'm sure you know this, like young people aren't apathetic. They're mm. desperate to be heard on the issues that impact them, impact our generation more than anybody else. It's just they don't see voting as a way to do that. 
Would Jonavi have been picked had that not been an election year? So, okay, first, she would have been picked because she's fantastic and go. doing great work. <laughs> but it is true that the honorees and their causes... I guess causes... I didn't really ask that question. No, 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 You know what I mean. I know. You guys I know what I mean. I to give some love to Jonavi. <laughs> 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 but no, but uh, in all seriousness, the what's what's really fascinating about Women of Worth is the the... The uh, women and the organizations that we recognize are truly sort of a microcosm of what's happening at the time, mm -hmm. and we see that each and every year. And so it's it's true that you know what we see this year is programs around mental health, programs around sustainability, programs around voters. Like we see a surge in topics that are present and relevant for these times. Um, you know, coming out of COVID, we saw a lot more in yeah. healthcare. So there's definitely a representative of sort of what's current at the moment in time, um, and we see that represented. Then in, in terms of the process, you know, we receive a couple thousand, two to 3,000 applications every year. We have a pretty rigorous process for recognizing and selecting the women. We, we um, invite our employees to get involved. We partner with Points of Light and, and a, an organization that helps us vet. And then we have, you know, we narrow down and we have a final group that we select with uh, colleagues that we work with, as well as our spokeswoman, Asia Naomi, Naomi King, who's very involved in this as well. Every year, she helps select um, the finalists, and she's with us at the, uh, the ceremony in November um, to, to, to choose the final 10. What does new voters look like post-presidential mm. election? Yeah, no, I mean, I think the critical thing that you guys definitely know, but there are elections every single year. There's two elections every year. Some states, there's four elections in a year. And civic engagement at the amongst everybody, but especially among young people, has to happen every day, 365, sometimes 366 days a year. So we are operational in around 400 high schools across the country, largely in Pennsylvania and Arizona. And what we do is we support the students and we empower them to run voter registration drives in their schools and get students who are both old enough to vote and also not old enough to vote to run a registration drive. Uh, in addition to that, every student is matched with a personal college mentor who helps them, you know, figure out how to mobilize their school, how to, you know, we're like use the different social cliques at your school, you know, like day one, get the lacrosse captain and the hmm. football captain to get their their team registered, then the drum major on day two, and then day three, like the NHS. I imagine president. debate team, you know, probably doesn't oh. mean much there. No, there are some there are some pools of people who are very civically engaged. Uh, I there is actually, and this actually leads into like another thing that we do, which is research on high school political behavior. Hmm. Because anecdotally, you can probably think that okay, you know, the music kids and the debate kids are very registered to vote, and the STEM kids and the athletes are probably less so. And there's actually no real research into oh. high school political behavior and civic engagement, kind of following along this trend of there not really being resources dedicated to high school students registering to vote. However, I do work with a number of incredible organizations. Through We lead a coalition called the New Voters Collaborative, which is around 30, 40 organizations dedicated to high school civic engagement, everything from the YMCA to When We All Vote. Um, and we meet every month to talk about high school civic engagement. But we also have a research network dedicated to figuring out why high school students vote or what makes them want to. And that's all done by researchers 19 years old and under. Jonavi, what's the what's the link now to registering these students and them actually going out and voting? Just because someone's registered doesn't mean they're gonna vote. Yeah, absolutely. However, among high, amongst high school students, 18 year olds, um, they actually found that around 80 to 83 percent of 18 year olds once registered to vote will turn out to vote just as a controlled, you know, looking at the voter file. So it is a pretty high conversion rate of registered voter to voter when it comes to 18 year olds. I think that it's it is necessary, though, to follow up any registration with conversations with inf information about registering to vote. I mean, it's something they found is as amazing as automatic voter just voter registration is, which is when the DMV will automatically yes. register mm -hmm. you to vote when you register to vote, they found that that has really low conversion huh. rates of registered voter to voter because there it's not coupled with a conversation. It's not coupled with, you know, 
this is why you should register to vote. So this is in no way saying that AVR shouldn't exist. It's it's incredibly important and essential to eliminating barriers to registering to vote. But it also means that you still need to have those conversations in the classroom. And again, that's something that teachers are afraid of doing. Um, and that's why as a nonprofit, as a student-led organization, or youth-led, I'm no longer a student, uh, <laughs> we, we really prioritize having those conversations across the political divides um, regularly. As we mentioned, Janavi Rao, just one of the honorees of the uh, L'Oreal Women of Worth program uh, this year. Ali, give us an idea of yeah. some of the other nine and where they're from and, and what yeah. they're working on. So the, the 10 women are a highly diverse group. So they represent many, many causes. They're represented across the United States, across age, ethnicity. And that is an important part of our program to really be as diverse as possible. In terms of causes, um, there's, there's quite a few um, very significant and, and emotional causes. So there's a woman named Laura Pahoulas who runs an organization called Control Alt Delete. And she provides resources for women who are in domestic violence situations to literally escape those dangerous environments. So she and her organization will literally come and rescue women and their children and help them get out of these organizations. There's another organization that is about helping refugees. We also know that's a very um, important topic of recent. Her name is Maymuna. Her organization is the TIA Foundation. So she supports helping refugees get on their feet following their move. And then there are, there are more health-focused organizations. So Sherry Mathis leads an organization called the Mammogram Poster Girls, mm. which is seems pretty straightforward, but is so needed. And um, I think what, what she has identified is that women in under served underprivileged neighborhoods are underrepresented getting mammograms. And we know you can prevent breast cancer through early detection or at least prevent mortality, you know, prevent uh, the most significant issues with early detection. And so her organization is really about providing mammograms, free mammograms to women who normally don't have access to them, um, which is really, really powerful. Um, so the the women are really fantastic. Um, it's a it's a fantastic it's a great group, um, all with amazing causes. You've met all of them, um, uh, uh, Janavi, and and so you've you've seen. I think what's also very powerful is we don't only just have the ten this year, but we have 190 women yeah, behind us. Yeah, talk about that a little bit because yes. you've. You've been coming on this program each and every yes. year for as long as I've been doing this program. And every year you bring somebody. Yes. And what they talk about are the resources that they yes. have with this group of alumni. Yeah. So, so you know, what we, what we do over time is, you know, we give them awareness. We've, we've evolved to be much more digitally led, social. So it was a bit more traditional when, five years ago when we've really moved how we uh, activate the women of worth to be much more modernized, so more digital. Um, we've enhanced with a program called Global Giving, which not only do we give financial resources, but now we have an opportunity through globalgiving.org for consumers to contribute to the organizations as well. And we've added a network through LinkedIn where we've connected all the 190 women. And what you know, when you have 190 women, you can imagine there's overlapping causes. But that's not a detriment because now we have a network of women who can help other women who've, who've been in similar circumstances. So the women who were recognized 10 years ago have evolved their organizations. They've scaled, they've learned, they've made mistakes, and now they can help the younger women, the, the newer women, support their organizations. The other thing is next year is, is our 20th anniversary, mm -hmm. um, which is super exciting. We are planning very big things. Our ambition is to bring back all 200 women mm. and make a real celebration of the impact that all of these 200 women have had together over the last 20 years, which is really powerful and really exciting. Uh, well, now you have to do it. You said it <laughs> I know. You said I know. It on it's, out so, it's on the record. So it's on the record. <laughs> Ali Goldstein, president of L'Oreal Paris USA here in our Bloomberg Interactive Brokers studio. Also with us, John V. Rao, honoree, founder and president of New Voters. It's that youth-led national nonprofit. They work to engage high school students uh, to ensure that youth voices are heard and prioritized in politics. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern. Listen on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. New York, known for its comedy scene, and a big part of that has to do with the New York Comedy Festival, which kicked off this weekend. 
It's where the best of the best comedians from all over gather each year. And this year, it's celebrating its 20th anniversary with more than 100 shows at venues throughout the five boroughs. We're talking names like Judd Apatow, Gabriel Iglesias, Bill Maher, Miss Pat, Tracy Morgan, and many, many more. Caroline Hirsch is the founder of Caroline's on Broadway. It operated from 1981 to 2022. She's also founded and produced the New York Comedy Festival for years. She joined us to talk about the Comedy Festival this month and the fine line between politics and comedy. We spoke to Caroline just before Election Day. We purposely had the festival after the election. Did you so really? We have something? Oh yeah, <laughs> you can't get in the middle of that this. That makes sense, right? Yeah. Talk a little bit about that, though. I mean, uh, a lot of the comedians yeah. you have that who Carol and I just mentioned, uh, politics front and center for them. And I think a guy like Bill Maher. I mean, oh, he's all Bill. over it. Oh, can't wait to see Bill. I think he. I think he gave a little promo on his show about the New York Comedy Festival. He did. He did. He's been, you know, he's, Bill's kind of like a fixture. Last year he took a year off, but, you know, he's back again. He's been in the festival for a number of years now, and we always usually have it like, um, actually one year uh, we didn't have, we had it before, and I think it was before Donald Trump got into office, and he had some words to say about that. So um, I have to say, you know, Bill's been this guy that is really center. He calls things out the way he sees them, and I think he's very honest. I mean, I, I love watching him, and I think Bill's got a bigger career now than he's ever had. Well, okay, so that's so interesting you say that because one thing that's different now that he's doing is this Club Random podcast, which is so different than his normal show, <laughs> right? It's a weekly show on HBO is what he's known for, but he has this podcast that he like just sits down with people and does these long interviews. Like, seems like everybody's doing this now. I think yeah. Listen, podcast is 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 the talk radio of today. So they're very interest, interesting people. We have lots of podcasts in the festival. They kind of like you know. So how did he get made? Um, you know, it, which is great. Which is a group of people that got together one night at a party and said, "Hey, how did that ever get made for TV?" And they created a podcast. People out love of it. that. Well, love wait. It. So wait. So when you think about what you want to do with the festival, and you've been doing it for such a long time, and I'm sure there's evolution and there's. Obviously, you know, the iconic comedians you want, I'm sure, are new voices. Tell us how you think about it every year. Well, we, we, we think about it like the day after we, uh, like, you know, the middle of this November coming up, we'll think about next year. But it takes about a year to get everybody kind of in line and between the schedules and this and that. So, you know, we have close to 300 shows around wow. New York City with, you know, 200 or more comedians that are around. So, you know, we have something for everyone. I mean, you know, we're at the greatest venues in the world you know, the Beacon Theater, Town Hall, Carnegie Hall, and it's an array of great comedians like uh, Nikki Glaser, Matano Lane, Randy Rainbow, Michelle Bateau, Rachel Brunahan, who played the marvelous Mrs. Maisel, yeah. mm -hmm. which is kind of a, you know, that, look, there are two hit shows on TV t today. They were the marvelous Mrs. Maisel and Hacks, and they both kind of centered around the life of You're John right. Rivers. Right. So here you go, uh, uh, an older lady. I got Carol on I did the Hacks train. I said, uh, you got to watch Hacks. Yeah, yeah, yeah which yeah. is really, well, but it's also a combination. You've got a lot of musicians, Bruce Springsteen. We have Bruce, but Bruce ha, is part of our big event. Ha, because why? Stand Up for Heroes. Love it. It's something that Bruce is. I mean, I should never question with. Bruce being anywhere, but he's saying been, that. He's been on the show for, it's our 18th year of doing Stand Up for Heroes. He's been on the show for 17 years. He took one year off when he was doing his Broadway show. And he's been a constant there, and he's very involved in, in with vet issues and raising these funds. And we have a stellar lineup this year. And it is a, it is the twentieth um, annual New York Comedy Festival, um, and the Stand Up for Here. Like Stand Up for Here is eighteen years. And eight, it's, it, eighteen years. And it's um, you know over this time we've raised over a hundred million dollars wow. for yeah. veteran causes. And I just went over, I'm on the board of, of the Woodrow Foundation, I just went over a number of grants. We gave out $10 million in grants this year. When there was a hurricane in Tampa, we were there helping yeah. out the vets. So we're like action-packed, vetted the best way you could possibly be, and this money is well spent with the veterans. I gotta say with veterans, I mean, nothing funny about it, that you know we have individuals in our country who go over and fight, and fight for freedom, and to protect other countries, to protect Americans and American assets, and come home, and then it's like they're forgotten. And it's, you know, I'm not gonna get political, but it is great to see the efforts that you do and others um, to help them out. Thank yeah. you. You mentioned Bruce Springsteen, but Jim Gaffigan, Nora Jones, Questlove, Jerry Seinfeld, John Stewart, among and others. And Mark Norman, yeah. Mark Norman, too, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great lineup. It's going to be super. What are you looking forward to? 
You I said Bill Maher. You said yeah. You know. I, I go. To, you know, get to see Bill. You know, Bill started with me in my first club on Eighth Avenue, so we've known each other for years. Um, I'm always excited to see him to hear what he has to say. Um, I'm excited for like. Did you know the Bill show? was going to do well, or did you think like what? Do you, like what is it when you see somebody or you know? Wow, this this person's going to be. Bill Bill had great stand up. He did. You know, forty years ago, yeah. So he was he was great at that and stayed with it. And then politically incorrect got him to where he is today. So you know he just was there, tenacity, and stayed with it and 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 did great. But we have a lot of people that have worked at the club for so many years, like Tracy Morgan, mm-hmm. J B Smooth, um, Miss Pat is at Town Hall also. Um, Adam Ray is playing Doctor Phil at the Beacon Theater. Jabuki Young White is also at the Hard Rock. The Hard Rock is playing a big part in the festival. We have shows there practically every night at the Hard Rock Hotel. It's a great venue that, that's there. Um, we have a tribute to Gilbert Gottfried that's there. Uh-huh. Um, so it's um, it's kind of taken the place of the Caroline space, and we're doing all of those shows there at the, at the Hard Rock. Um, we're going to talk more about Caroline's in just a minute, but I do want to get you to weigh in on the election stuff and just like the way that comedy has played in just over the last week. I mean, if you think about what happened at Madison Square Garden with Tony Hinchcliffe and the way that that comment from him just dominated the news cycle, did you think we'd be talking about like a comic who's known for roasts? No, not Affecting at all. the presidential know, election? It, you know, what you call it is like a bad booking. You know, just like a bad booking and sh- it shouldn't have happened. Um, but then again, you hire Tony, you have to know what comes with Tony. It's like, you know, there's no filter. So you really can't, you really can't, filter a comedian like that, as you know from the Tom Brady roast. I mean, he was really out there, so you have to know, you know, so, you know, the person that booked him on the show, not a, not Like not maybe a good, not something you would we, suggest for, poli- for a political closing I would, rally. if I was in charge of that, for the comedians, never, I would never put him up there, so. What type of comedian would you put up? Well, you know, we had, rally? we had, we had Jim Gaffigan that was at the Al Smith dinner. Yeah. And yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, he made points. Yeah, but a little more, you know, you know, tasteful. Yeah, you know, he's tasteful. a conservative, but he made points a different way. So there's a way to do it. So you have to know, you know, you have to know how to book it. So Tony was not the right person to be there at that time. So can we assume that the festival, since it'll be after the election, that there'll be a lot of political. <laughs> <laughs> you should see Carol. All right, face. close up on Caroline. Yeah, I was like. <laughs> Are you kidding me with this question, Carol Messer? I mean, well, what do you make of what? I know, I know. All right, so I asked the obvious. I asked the obvious. I mean, I I watch the late shows at night, and it's not a night that doesn't go by between Kimball and, and Colbert. It just doesn't stop. It's like I have to walk out of the room until the monologue's over. It just, it doesn't stop. From a comedy, From a comedy perspective, though, does SNL still carry the weight that it once did? I, mean, I think we're all, we're all talking about it, so I guess it does. Yeah. Really? Yes, yeah. Yeah, interesting because yeah. I, I wasn't expecting you to say that I was expecting you to say okay well you know maybe podcasts YouTube and you know these sort of things that get people TikTok even it, it, it does, we've it talked does, about with but, you in the past but but they re- repurpose everything from SNL goes on to all of those sites the next day so that's where they connect with young people they really mm. do I mean I think I just read that SNL did a big deal right now with TikTok there's a lot of stuff from SNL on there so Wow. Um, it gets repurposed and then it gets seen and it gets everybody just talking about it so that when the news knows that Kamala Harris goes on to that, we all talk about it the next day. So it's it was a, it's a good booking for her. I was going to say, what about it being a springboard for young comedians in this day and age? I mean, you used to be on SNL and that's where so many legends got their start. Didn't yeah. I? I thought I also read that Billy Crystal, SNL, passed on him and then he did you... Did Car- oh, and that yes. he like t- and then ended up on SNL. That was probably, I believe, in 1984, 85. Dick Ebersole came in. Lorne Michaels was not producing then. Dick Ebersole came in and put him on, and then Billy just exploded again. Yeah, so yeah. it's just kind of interesting. Hey, Caroline's was like a good luck charm for a lot of people. Um, so, so how do you think about bringing it back in some form? Well, I think we want to bring it back in a bigger way, more of a big event that might happen. You like know, once a country. year or something, or, or maybe you more around? than that. Yeah, she so, looks guilty. She, looks, that, like you she here, looks like she's got something cooking you over sat here. here a year ago. <laughs> you sat here a year ago and said, "You'll have something for us next time you're here." <laughs> so that we're, we're, we're still we're, working we're, on it. We're, we're still working on it. Yeah. When you yeah. say bigger, you mean outside of New York too? Maybe. I, yeah, I mean like you know, Caroline's like 
as the brand taking bigger and just out, outside of the four Broadway walls, well, it'll be in other people's walls. One thing that we've we've talked about uh, at Bloomberg Business Week is this idea that Joe Rogan is trying to make Austin happen mm -hmm. as a center for comedy, like it mm -hmm. happened in L.A. and New York. Do you buy that? Um, I think he's done a good job of bringing a lot of comedians there. I don't know if it'll be the the centerpiece of comedy, but he's bringing you know the New York the New York comedians and the L.A. comedians, and and the Dave Chappelle's to go in there. But I you know at, New York is where it's at. In New York is where it's at. New York is bigger than L.A. For, for comedy. So, how do you think about comedy and like the evolution of it? I mean, I grew up with a dad. Um, I'm trying to think the roasts. Um, with like Dean Martin and so like just and they still continue but does it really change in terms of what makes people laugh no I think it's you know it, it, it's what makes you laugh is 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 the common thread of the joke because it happened to you it happened to me ha 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 isn't that funny yeah so that's really why we all love comedy because it brings us together in a way to enjoy something and that's really why it makes you feel good. Yeah. And it's a stress reliever. And you know, well, with that's what comedy, we always talk about loving to laugh. <laughs> with with comedy, so you stress. can take some of the bad news. It could be repurposed in a, in another way. That was Caroline Hirsch, founder of Caroline's on Broadway, also producer of the New York Comedy Festival, taking place right now. Still ahead on Bloomberg Business Week, Sean White's next big trick, the best place to ski around the world, and the right gear to get the job done. It's all in pursuits, the ski edition. That's next. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern. Listen on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. The average person probably won't be able to appreciate the acrobatics involved in a cab double cork 1440. Maybe Chris Rouser can, but they can surely appreciate <laughs> ski resorts with the best powder, slopeside ramen shops, and hot springs to soothe sore muscles. It's all in the pursuit section of Business Week magazine. It's out on newsstands now at Bloomberg.com and on the Bloomberg terminal. It's the ski edition, probably one of my favorite editions to talk about each and every year. We begin with famed Olympic snowboarder Sean White's mission to take the sport to new heights. With us, we got the editor of Bloomberg Pursuits, and also the Bloomberg Businessweek contributor who wrote the story about the Olympic champion, Jen Murphy, joining us too. So back when I lived in Colorado, in Vail after college, they had this thing called the Snowboarder Sandwich, which oh, was okay. free. <laughs> it's all, like it's it. totally free, okay? Okay. You go to the, the place where you get the food, uh -huh. and you go to the saltines, you grab the saltines and you fill them with Cholula sauce, okay. and that's your, that's your lunch on the ski slopes. So salty. But it turns out it's not just, you know, everybody who's a poor snowboarder. It's also the professionals who shockingly don't earn any money yes. snowboarding. Chris, I was shocked I to see, see where this. this story has found its way to our everyone to needs our an editor. Today. My editor is Chris. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, snowboarding nationally in the U.S. is on the rise. Um, and there were it, it was up 10 percent last year. There was something like nine point nine million Americans who snowboarded at some point or another. Uh, skiing is actually slightly on the decline. But snowboarding as a professional sport has sort of only really ever had a patchwork of competitions. Professional athletes actually end up spending more money than they, they can possibly earn. And it just doesn't have the sort of fan base that a lot of other sports have. So Sean White, our, probably our most famous snowboarder, decided to change that with a new organization called the Snow League which is going to be a series of, in, of international competitions. Hopefully you'll be able to watch it on TV. And it'll actually, uh, they'll count as Olympic qualifiers. So Jen Murphy, come on in here because you had an exclusive interview with Sean White all about his attempt to try to give it the F1 effect. What's his big plan and, and who's backing it? Um, you know, it's really exciting. I think for him, he obviously had his legacy as an athlete, you know, most decorated Olympian in snowboarding. Um, and now this is his next legacy to really make this a sustainable career path for athletes. So it's going to kick off the snow. You will kick off this March in Aspen, Colorado, which is quite exciting. Um, that has been home to the X Games for years and will continue to be. Sean has brought in some seriously big investors. Um, some of them include Blackstone Inc.'s David Blitzer, former NFL star Larry Fitzgerald Jr., 
Range Sports is going to be advising on the media rights and um, the commercial partnership strategy. And, you know, the big thing I think that's gotten attention from, particularly from the athletes, is the prize purse. You know, as Chris was saying, traditionally you just didn't make a lot of money from snowboarding competitions. People really had to rely on sponsors to help support them and support their travel costs. And Snow League is promising a $1.5 million prize purse, and that will be split between men and women equally. Um, and that's, you know, this this sport hasn't seen that type of prize money before. So it, it's really exciting. And I will also note, you know, in the media, a lot of this coverage on the Snow League has talked about snowboarding, but it will also include free skiing as well. So not just snowboarding, but free skiing as well will be introduced in the um, later half of the first season, which will be in 2026. We'll talk about the timing of this, Jen, because it comes at a really interesting time for snow sports, where we're seeing not necessarily an increase over the last few years in the number of people who are skiing, but an increase in the number of people who are snowboarding. So what's happening there? Yeah, you know, this great book just came out, The Darkest White by Eric Blem, and it looks back at the late snowboarder Craig Kelly's life. He sadly died in an avalanche, but back in the day, like he was, you know, Sean White went to his snowboarding camp, like he was the first, I think, true snowboarding star. And the book chronicles the whole history of snowboarding. So, you know, in the late 90s and early aughts, snowboarding was like the cool kind of counterculture thing to do and have this rise. And then it kind of started to fall off and people, you know, as ski gear and equipment got better and better, more people turned to skiing. And now we're seeing that change again. And snowboarding's having this, you know, other comeback, um, which is really exciting to, to see. There's obviously the X Games, which I think people are familiar with, that has a lot of different kinds of sports, both winter and summer. Um, are there other snowboard tours that are happening that are kind of catching on to this moment you're describing? So now it's it's very interesting. And it's, you know, these leagues, including the Snow League, really want to move away from the term extreme sports and say action sports. Mm-hmm. Um it still sounds sounds action and extreme to me, but you know they're they're focusing on this action sports, and I think that came from the Olympics, really when the Olympics started including the half pipe for snowboarding, freestyle skiing. Now we have surfing, mountain biking. It's really the Olympics has put it on the radar of a much broader audience, and so a few days before Sean announced the Snow League, the X Games actually announced that they will be launching for 2026 the X League, which will be a new action sports. um, Now they have the X Games, which is just a competition, but this will be a full-on league. And then Natural Selection Tour is a um, more of a freestyle snowboarding competition that pro snowboarders Travis Race had started a few years ago. He has just, I think only a week ago, and we covered this in Uh, pursuits as well he announced that he will be expanding to the natural selection tour to surfing mountain biking and freestyle skiing so and you know back in the day we had a few different snowboarding competitions like the dew tour by mountain dew and COVID kind of shut them down and the prize money wasn't there but i do think you mentioned earlier you know the f1 effect the success of f1 particularly due to the um Netflix series, The Drive to Survive, really showed people that these more obscure sports have huge potential because the characters are so fascinating. So both Sean and Travis Rice of Natural Selection have have said they are really leaning heavy on the storytelling and content and mentioned, you know, creating some docu-style series inspired by Drive to Survive to really help put these athletes on people's radar. And even if you aren't into freestyle skiing or snowboarding, I mean, you're going to get hooked on following these athletes. I would watch that, no question. And I think I think it's a pretty cool sort of like next move for somebody who has spent his entire life, Chris, in the industry, someone like Sean White, who is a legend to so many people. And don't forget, he's got the whole video game thing, too, going yeah. for him. And the luxury mm-hmm. thing. The luxury which thing, Which we too. love. He has, he's, you know, um, made snowboards for Montclair. Like, he has, he's a bunch of luxury sponsors, and he wants to spread that around, get, the, get some of that biz. Hey, Jen, I know you have to run because you're in Africa. I think you're about to get on a plane. But before <laughs> you... boarding a flight. You're, you're boarding. Yeah. Before you do that, can we get, like, one minute on some gear ahead of the ski season? Because you got a great piece in Pursuits about boots and skis. Um, what should we have our eyes on? 
Oh, it's such a good question. Um, so I grew up snowboarding and I'm a new skier. So this is this new gear is really exciting for me because a lot of the technology we're seeing out there, um, if you're an okay skier, this will make you feel like you've just improved going like, you know, leaps and bounds in one season because the, the technology we're seeing. So I would say quickly, the Nordic Enforcer 99 is the ski I have my eye on um, for this year. It has this cool new, like they call it a pulse core, which is basically an underfoot layer of rubber to kind of dampen the ski so you can get through choppier terrain without really like punishing your legs. Um, I kind of joke and say it's the Goldilocks of all mountain, all condition skis this year. Um, boots, which people have, you know, one reason I stayed away from skiing was because friends always complained about the boots and we're seeing saying you're so uncomfortable we're seeing these really cool new boots including a whole new uh, boot brand called phenom um they are b core certified they have a whole new design which looks really weird um but it has a wider toe box and it doesn't sacrifice heel hold so i would check those out there that is from the faction ski company wish i would have could go back in time and save my purchase from a couple of years ago and, and go and try yeah. some of these. Jen, really appreciate you taking the time. Know you got to run. Jen Murphy, she's a Bloomberg Business Week contributor. Chris, one place I've always wanted to go skiing and I never have, and I'm don't, not going to go this year, is Japan. It is so hot right now. I know. Well, so hot in the sense of like everybody wants to go skiing there. And part of the reason is because... Well, it hasn't been good snow in other parts of the world. Yeah. You know, we should be optimistic about snow this year um, in other parts of the world because of La Nina. But uh, I some of my best friends are all going to Niseko this year. And I am afire with jealousy because we always write about skiing in Japan and how the powder is totally incredible. And it's, you know... When you got little kids, it's going to be a long time before I can get all the way out there, <laughs> like you, Tim. Um, but yeah, in the in the section this week, we have a guide to uh, three of the places that th- three of the ski s- sort of centers that we recommend, and that you know you may not know so much about if you're skiing out in the West, um, particularly. You may know Niseko, but you may not know Hakaba Valley and Nozawa Onsen, which are two places which are actually uh, a little closer to Tokyo, and. Um, and maybe a little bit less known, but they have the same like incredible powder. Hakaba Valley is known as the next Niseko, and um, you know there's fun, there's really good hotels at all the places. Um, so if you don't necessarily want to get to Niseko, but you can get to Japan, there's these other places. Yeah, and I love how each of the uh, resorts that you take us through sort of gives the pros, the cons, and like what to expect there. Ski passes are so much cheaper in Japan than they are in the U.S. Well, everything is cheaper in Japan, famously. Right but now. but like this but yes oh yeah but of course like to ski, ski on, passes everywhere ski pass yeah the U S is just so it's gotten so expensive for skiing uh, speaking of expensive places to ski you got a list of sort of like ski this not that in pursuits right now about yes. different places to go uh, in the same region so you have a, a you know a couple here in the U S but also some in Europe as well yeah so in the print edition we have uh, three places in Europe that we recommend because you know a lot of times. You know about a certain place. You, you hear your friends talking about Courchevel, Megev, something like that, and you want to go. And then, whoa, it's crowded, it's expensive. I waited too long. And then there's other places right nearby, like right around the corner, um, and that are you know less crowded but beloved by locals and maybe even better or more interesting. So instead of Courchevel, France, we recommend you try Saint Nicolas de Verche, um, which is uh, which is actually part of the same Mont Blanc ski region. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's less crowded and also less expensive, and it's accessible for more le- uh, levels of skiers. We just scratched the surface when it comes to the ski special in Bloomberg Pursuit. So everybody check it out. It's on the Bloomberg Terminal. It's at Bloomberg.com slash Business and also on newsstands now. Chris Rouser, the editor of Bloomberg Pursuits. Thanks. Thanks, guys. For Carol Masser, I'm Tim Stenevec. Have a good and safe weekend. This is the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, TuneIn, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.